Chapter Fifteen of the Czar's Spy by William Lecoeur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Just off the Strand, a week had gone by. The Nord Express had brought me post haste across Europe from Petersburg to Calais, and I was again in London. I had left Elma in the care of the Princess Zurloff whom I knew would conceal her from the horde of police agents now in search of her. The mystery had so increased until now it had become absolutely bewildering. The more I had tried to probe it, the more inexplicable had I found it. My brain was a whirl as I sat in the wagon lit rushing across those wide, never-ending plains that lie between the Russian capital and Berlin, and the green valleys between the Rhinelands and the sea. The maze of mystery rendered me utterly incapable of grasping one solid tangible fact, so closely interwoven was each incident of the strange life-drama in which, through mere chance, I was now playing a leading part. I was aware of one fact only, that I loved Elma with all my soul, even though I knew not whom she really was or her strange life story. Her sweet face, with those soft brown eyes, so tender and intense, stood out ever before me, sleeping or waking. Each moment as the express rushed south increased the distance between us. Yet was I not on my way back to England with a clear and distinct purpose? I snatched at any clue, however small, with desperate eagerness, as a drowning man clutches at a straw. It was a cold but dry November night in London, and I sat dining with Jack Durnford at a small table in the big, well-lit room of the Junior United Service Club. Easy going and merry as of old, my friend was bubbling over with good spirits, delighted to be back again in town after three years sailing up and down the Mediterranean from Jib to Smyrna. Maneuvering always, yet with never a chance of a fight, his well-shaven face bore the mark of the southern suns, and the backs of his hands were tanned by the heat and the sea. He was indeed as smart an officer as any at the junior, for the marines are proverbial for their neatness, and his men on board the bulwark had received many a pleasing compliment from the admiral. "'Glad to be back!' he exclaimed, as he helped himself to a peg. "'I should rather think so, old chap.' You know how awfully wearying the life becomes out there. Lots going on down at Palermo, Malta, Monte Carlo, or over at Algiers, and yet we can never get a chance of it. We're always in sight of the gay places and never land. I don't blame the youngsters for getting off from Leghorn for two days over here in town when they can. Three years is a bigger slice out of a fellow's life than anyone would suppose. But by the way, I saw Hutchison the other day. We put him to Spezia, and he came out to see the Admiral. Got dispatches for him, I think. He seems as gay as ever. He lunched at mess, and said how sorry he was you deserted Leghorn. I haven't exactly deserted it, I said, but I really don't love it like he does. No, a year or two of the Mediterranean blue is quite sufficient to last any fellow his lifetime. I shouldn't live in Leghorn if I had my choice. I'd prefer somewhere up in the mountains, beyond Pisa or outside Florence, where you can have a good time in winter. Then a silence fell between us, and I sat eating on until the end of the meal, wondering how to broach the question I so desired to put to him. I shall try if I can get on recruiting service at home for a bit, he said presently. There's an appointment up in Glasgow vacant and I shall try for it. It'll be better, at any rate, than China or the Pacific. I was just about to turn the conversation to the visit of the mysterious Lola to Leghorn, when two men he knew entered the dining-room, and, recognizing him, came across to give him a welcome home. One of the newcomers was Major Bartlett, whom I at once recollected as having been a guest of Leithcourt's up at Rannoch and the other a younger man whom Durnford introduced me to as Captain Hanbury. "'Oh, Major!' I cried, rising and grasping his hand. "'I haven't seen you since Scotland, and the extraordinary ending to your house-party.' "'No,' he laughed. "'It was an amazing fair, wasn't it? 
After the Leithcourts left, it was like pandemonium let loose. The guests collared everything they could lay their hands upon. It's a wonder to me the disgraceful affair didn't get into the papers. But where's Leithcourt now? I asked anxiously. Haven't the ghost of an idea, replied the Major, standing astride with his hands in his pockets. Young Paget of ours told me the other day that he saw Muriel driving in the terminus road at Eastbourne, but she didn't notice him. They were a queerish lot, those Leithcourts, he added. "'Hello, what are you saying about the Leithcourts, Charlie?' exclaimed Durnford, turning quickly from Hanbury. "'I know some people of that name, Philip Leithcourt, who has a daughter named Muriel.' "'Well, they sound much the same. But if you know them, my dear old chap, I really don't envy you your friends,' declared the Major with a laugh. "'Why not?' "'Well, Greg will tell you,' he said. "'He knows perhaps more than I do. "'But,' he added, "'they may not, of course, be the same people.' "'I first met them yachting over at Algiers,' Jack said, "'and then again at Malta, "'where they seemed to have quite a lot of friends. "'They had a steam yacht, the Iris, "'and were often up and down the Mediterranean.' "'Must be the same people,' declared the Major. "'Leithcourt spoke once or twice of his yacht.' but we all put it down as a non-existent vessel because he was always drawing the long bow about his adventures and how did you first come to know him i asked of the major eagerly oh i don't know somebody brought him to mess and we struck up an acquaintance across the table he seemed a good chap and when he asked me to shoot i accepted on arrival up at rannoch however one thing struck me as jolly strange and that was that among the people I was asked to meet was one of the very worst blacklegs about town. He called himself Martin Woodruff up there, although I'd known him at the old Corinthian club as Dick Archer. He was believed then to be one of a clever gang of international thieves. When I first met him, he gave me the name of Hornby, I said. It was in Leghorn, where he was on board a yacht called the Lola, of which he represented himself as owner. He left Rannoch very suddenly, remarked Bartlett. We understood that he was engaged to marry Muriel. If so, I'm sorry for her, poor girl. What? cried Durnford, starting up. That man to marry Muriel Leithcourt? Yes, I said, why? But his countenance had turned pale, and he gave no answer to my question. If these same Leithcourts are really friends of yours, Durnford, old fellow, I'm sorry I've said anything against them the major exclaimed in an apologetic tone only the end of my visit was so abrupt and so extraordinary and the company such a mixed one that well to tell you the truth the people are a mysterious lot altogether perhaps our leith courts are not the same as those jack knows i remarked in order to escape from a rather difficult situation whereupon durnford as though eager to conceal his surprise said with a forced laugh Oh, probably not, and reseated himself at table. Then the Major quickly changed the topic of conversation, and afterwards he and his friend passed along to their table and sat down to eat. I could not help noticing that Jack Durnford was upset at what he had learned, yet I hesitated just then to put any question to him. I resolved to approach the subject later, so as to allow him time to question me if he wished to do so. After smoking an hour, we went across to the Empire, where we spent the evening in the Grand Circle, meeting many men we knew, and having a rather pleasant time among old acquaintances. If a man who had lived the club life of London returns from abroad, he can always run across someone he knows in the circle of the Empire about ten o'clock at night. Jack was, however, not his old self that he had been before dinner. His brow was now heavy and thoughtful, and he appeared deeply immersed in some intricate problem, for his eyes were fixed vacantly when opportunity was afforded him to think, and he appeared to desire to avoid his friends rather than to greet them. After the theatre I induced him to come round to the Cecil, and in the wicker chair in the big portico before the entrance we sat to smoke our final cigars. It is a favourite spot of mine when in London, for at afternoon, when the string band plays, and other cosmopolitans drink tea, 
there is a continual coming and going a little panorama of life that to a student of men like myself is intensely interesting and at night it is just as amusing to sit there in the shadow and watch the people returning from the theatres or dances and to speculate as to whom and what they are at that one little corner of london just off the strand you see more variety of men and women than perhaps at any other spot all grades pass before you from the pushful american commercial man interested in a patent medicine to the proud indian rajah with his turban sweet from the variety actress to the daughter of a peer or the wife of a millionaire pork butcher doing europe you've been a bit down in the mouth to-night jack i said presently after we had been watching the cabs coming up depositing the homecoming revelers from the savoy or the carlton yes he sighed and surely i have enough to cause me after what i've heard from bartlett what did the facts he told you convey any bad news to you i inquired with pretended ignorance yes he said hoarsely after a brief pause then he added bartlett said you could tell me what happened up in scotland where leithcourt had shooting tell me everything he added with the air of a man in whom all hope is dead well i began the leithcourts took rannoch castle close to my uncle's place near dumfries i got to know them of course and often shot with his party one day however i was amazed to notice in one of the rooms the photograph of a lady the exact counterpart of that picture which i recollect i told you when in leghorn i had found torn up on board the lola you recollect what i narrated about my strange adventure don't you i remember every word was his answer go on what did you do nothing i held my tongue but when i discovered that the fellow who called himself woodruff the man who had represented himself as the owner of the lola and who no doubt had had a hand in breaking open hutcheson safe in the consulate was engaged to muriel i became full of suspicion well woodruff after meeting me disappeared went to hamburg they said on business then other things occurred a man and a woman were found murdered up in the woods about a mile and a half from the castle the man was made up to represent my man olinto i believe you've seen him in leghorn what they've killed olinto he gasped starting from his chair no the fellow was made up very much like him but his wife armida was killed they killed the woman and believed they had also killed the husband eh he said bitterly through his teeth and i saw that his strong hands grasped the arms of his chair firmly and martin woodruff is engaged to muriel leithcourt are you certain of this yes quite certain and is there no suspicion as to who is the assassin of the woman santini and this mysterious man who posed as her husband none whatever for some time jack durnford smoked in silence and i could just distinguish his white hard face in the faint light for it was now late and the big electric lamps had been turned out and we were in semi-darkness that fellow shall never marry muriel he declared in a fierce hoarse voice what you have just done reveals the truth did you meet chater he appeared suddenly at rannoch and the leithcourts fled precipitately and have not since been heard of ah, no wonder he remarked with a dry laugh no wonder but look here gordon i'm not going to stand by and let that scoundrel woodruff marry muriel you love her perhaps i hazarded yes i do love her he admitted and by heaven he cried i will tell the truth and crush the whole of their ingenious plot have you met elma heath he asked yes i said in quick anxiety then listen he said in a low earnest voice listen and i'll tell you something there is a greater mystery surrounding that yacht the lola than you have ever imagined my dear old chap declared jack durnford looking me straight in the face when you told me about it on the quarter-deck that day outside leghorn i was half a mind to tell you what i knew only one fact prevented me 
my disinclination to reveal my own secrets. I loved Muriel Leithcourt, yet afloat as I was, I could never see her. I could not obtain from her own lips the explanation I desired. Yet I would not prejudge her. No, and I won't now, he added, with a fierce resolution. I love her, he went on, and she reciprocates my love. Ours is a secret engagement made in Malta two years ago. And yet you tell me that she has pledged herself to that fellow Woodruff, the man known here in London as Dick Archer? I can't believe it. I really can't, old fellow. She could never write to me as she has done, urging patience and secrecy until my return. Unless, of course, she desired to gain time, I suggested. But my friend was silent. His brows were deep-knit. Woodruff is at the present moment in Petersburg, I said. I've just come back from there. In Petersburg, he gasped, surprised. Then he is with that villainous official Baron Oberg, the Governor-General of Finland. No, Oberg is living shut up in his palace at Helsingfors, fearing to go out lest he shall be assassinated, was my answer. And Elma, what has become of her? She is in hiding in Petersburg, awaiting such time as I can get her safely out of Russia. And then, continuing, I explained how she had been maimed and rendered deaf and dumb. What? he cried fiercely. Have they actually done that to the poor girl? Then they feared that she should reveal the nature of their plot, for she had seen and heard. Seen and heard what? Be patient, we will elucidate this mystery and the motive of this terrible infliction upon her. Muriel wrote to me saying that poor Elma, her friend, had disappeared, and she feared that some evil had also happened to her. So Oberg had sent her to his fortress, his own private Bastille, the place to which, on pretended charges of conspiracy against Russia, he sends those who thwart him to a living tomb. I have seen him, and I have defied him, I said. You have? Man alive! Be careful! He's not a fellow who sticks at trifles, said Jack warningly. I don't fear, I replied. Elma's enemies are also mine. Then I take it, old fellow, that notwithstanding her affliction, you are actually in love with her? I intend to rescue and to marry her, I answered quite frankly. But first we must tear aside this veil of mystery and ascertain all the facts concerning her, he said. At present I only know one or two very vague details. The Baron is certainly not her uncle, as he represents himself to be, but it seems certain that she is the daughter of Anglo-Russian parents and was born in Russia and brought to England when a child. But from whom do you expect I can obtain the true facts concerning her, and the reason of the Baron's desire to keep her silent? Ah, he said, twisting his moustache thoughtfully, that's just the question. For a solution of the problem, we must first fathom the motive of the Leithcourts and the reason they fled in fear before that fellow Chater. That Muriel is innocent of any complicity in their plot, whatever it may be, I feel convinced. She may be the victim of that blackleg Woodruff, who, as Bartlett has told you, is one of the most expert swindlers in London and who has already done two terms of penal servitude. But what was the motive in breaking open the consul's safe, if not to obtain the foreign office or admiralty ciphers? Perhaps they wanted to steal them and sell them to a foreign government? No, that was not their object. I've thought it over many, many times since you told me, and I feel convinced that Woodruff is too shrewd a fellow not to have known that no consul goes away on leave and allows his ciphers to remain behind. When he leaves his post, he always deposits those precious books either at the foreign office here, or with his consul general, or with a consul at another port. They'd certainly ascertain all that before they made the raid, you bet. The affair was a risky one, and Dick Archer is known as a man of many precautions but he is on extremely friendly terms with Elma. It was he who succeeded in finding her in Finland and taking her beyond Oberg's sphere of influence to Petersburg. Then it is certainly only an affected friendship with some sinister motive underlying it. 
She wrote a letter from her island prison to an old schoolfellow named Lydia Morton, asking her to see Woodruff at his rooms in Cork Street, and tell him that through all she was suffering she had kept her promise to him, and that the secret was still safe. Exactly, and now the fellow fears that as you are so actively searching out the truth, she may yield to your demands and explain. He therefore intends to silence her. What? To kill her, you mean? I gasped, in quick apprehension. Well, he might do so, in order to save himself, you see, Jack replied, adding. He certainly would have no compunction if he thought that it would not be brought home to him. Only he, no doubt, fears you, because you have found her and are in love with her. I admitted the force of his argument, but recollected that my dear one was safe in concealment, and that the princess was our friend, even though I, as an Englishman, had no sympathy with the doctrine of the bomb and the knife. I tried to get from him all that he knew concerning Elma, but he seemed, for some curious reason, disinclined to tell. All I could gather was that Leithcourt was in league with Chater and Woodruff, and that Muriel had acted as an entirely innocent agent. What the conspiracy was, or what was its motive, I could not discern. I was as far off the solution of the problem as ever. We must first find Muriel, he declared, when I pressed him to tell me everything he knew. There are facts you have told me which negative my own theories, and only from her can we obtain the real truth. But surely you know where she is. She writes to you, I said. The last letter which I received at Jib ten days ago was from the Hotel Bristol at Boatson in the Tyrol. Yet Bartlett says she has been seen down at Eastbourne. But you have an address where you always write to her, I suppose? Yes, a secret one. I have written and made an appointment, but she has not kept it. She has been prevented, of course. She may be with her parents and unable to come to London. You did not know that they had fled and were in hiding? Of course not. What I've heard tonight is news to me. Amazing news. And does it not convey to you the truth? It does, a ghastly truth concerning Elma Heath, he answered in a low voice, as though speaking to himself. Tell me, what? I'm dying, Jack, to know everything concerning her. Who is that fellow, Oberg? Her enemy. She, by mere accident, learned his secret and Woodruff's, and now they both live in deadly fear of her. And for that reason she was taken to Siena, where some villainous Italian doctor was bribed to render her deaf and dumb? He nodded in the affirmative. But Chater? I know very little concerning him. He may have conspired with them, or he may be innocent. It seems as though he were antagonistic to their schemes, if Leithcourt and his family really fled from him. And yet he was on board the Lola. Indeed, he may have helped to commit the burglary at the consulate, I said. Quite likely, he answered, but our first object must be to rediscover Muriel. Paget says she is in Eastbourne. If she is there, we shall easily find her. They publish visitors' lists in the papers, don't they, like they do at Hastings? Then he added, visitors' lists are most annoying when you find your name printed in them when you are supposed officially to be somewhere else. I was had once like that by the Bournemouth papers, when I was supposed to be on duty over at Queenstown. I narrowly escaped a terrible wigging. Shall we go to Eastbourne? I suggested eagerly. I'll go there with you in the morning. Or would it not be best to send an urgent wire to the address where I always write? She would then reply here, no doubt. If she's in Eastbourne, there may be reasons why she cannot come up to town. If her people are in hiding, of course she won't come, but she'll make an appointment with me, no doubt. Very well, send a wire, I said, and make it urgent. It will then be forwarded. But as regards Olinto, would you like to see him? He might tell you more than he has told me. No, by no means. He must not know that I have returned to London, declared my friend quickly. You had better not see him, you understand? Then his interests are, well, not exactly our own? No. But why don't you tell me more about Elma, I urged, for I was eager to learn all he knew. Come, 
"'Do tell me,' I implored. "'I've told you practically everything, my dear fellow,' was his response. "'The revelation of the true facts of the affair can be made only by Muriel. "'I tell you, we must find her.' "'Yes, we must, at all hazards,' I said. "'Let's go across to the telegraph office opposite Charing Cross. "'It's open always.' and we rose and walked out along the strand now nearly deserted and dispatched an urgent message to muriel at an address in hurlingham road fulham afterwards we stood outside on the curb still talking i loath to part from him when there passed by in the shadow two men in dark overcoats who crossed the road behind us to the front of charing cross station and then continued on towards trafalgar square as the light of the street lamp fell upon them, I thought I recognized the face of one as that of a person I had seen before, yet I was not at all certain, and my failure to remember whom the passer-by resembled prevented me from saying anything further to Jack than, "'A fellow I know has just gone by, I think.' "'We seem to be meeting hosts of friends tonight. he laughed. "'After all, old chap, it does one good to come back to our dear, dirty old town again we abuse it when we are here and talk of the life in paris and vienna and brussels but when we are away there is no place on earth so dear to us for it is home but there he laughed i'm actually growing romantic ah if we could only find muriel but we must to-morrow ta-ta i shall go around to the club and sleep for i haven't fixed on any diggings yet Come in at ten to-morrow, and we will decide upon some plan. One thing is plainly certain. Elma must at once be got out of Russia. She's in deadly peril of her life there. Yes, I said, and you will help me? With all my heart, old fellow, answered my friend, warmly grasping my hand, and then when we parted, he strolling along towards the National Gallery on his way back to the junior, while I return to the Cecil alone. End of chapter 15chapter 16 of the Czar's Spy by William Lecoeur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Marked Men Captain Durnford, I inquired of the hall porter of the club the next morning. Not here, sir. But he slept here last night, I remarked. I have an appointment with him. The man consulted the big book before him and answered, Captain Durnford went out at 9.27 last night, sir, but has not returned. Strange, I thought, but although I waited in the club nearly an hour, he did not put in an appearance. I called again at noon, and he had not come in, and again at two o'clock, but he had not even then made his appearance. Then I began to be anxious. I returned to the hotel, resolved to wait for a few hours longer. He might have altered his mind and gone to Eastbourne in search of Muriel. Yet had he done so, he would surely have telegraphed to me. About four o'clock, as I was passing through the big hall of the hotel, I heard a voice behind me utter a greeting in Italian, and turning in surprise found Olinto, dressed in his best suit of black, standing hat in hand. In an instant I recollected what Jack had told me, and regarded him with some suspicion. "'Signor Commentatore,' he said in a low voice, as though fearing to be overheard, "'may I be permitted to speak in private with you?' "'Certainly,' I said, and I took him in the lift up to my room. "'I have come to warn you, Signore,' he said, when I had given him a seat. "'Your enemies mean harm to you.' "'And who are they, pray?' I asked, biting my lips. "'The same, I suppose, who prepared that ingenious trap in Lambeth? "'I am not here to reveal to you who they are, Signore, "'only to warn you to have a care of yourself,' was the Italian's reply. "'Look here, Olinto,' I exclaimed determinedly. "'I've had enough of this confounded mystery. "'Tell me the truth regarding the assassination of your poor wife up in Scotland.' Ah, signore, he answered sadly in a changed voice. I do not know. It was a plot. Someone represented me, but he was killed also. They believed they had struck me down, he added with a bitter laugh. 
Poor Armida's body was found concealed behind a rock on the opposite side of the wood. I saw it. Ah! he cried, shuddering. Then you were ignorant of the identity of your wife's assassin? Entirely. Tell me one thing, I said. Did Almeida possess any trinket in the form of a little enameled cross, like a miniature cross of Cavaliere? Yes, I gave it to her. I found it on the floor at the mansion house where I was engaged as odd waiter for a banquet. I know I ought to have given it up to the Lord Mayor's servants, but it was such a pretty little thing that I was tempted to keep it. It probably had fallen from the coat of one of the diplomatists dining there. I was silent. The faint suspicion that Oberg had been at that spot was now entirely removed. The only clue I had was satisfactorily accounted for. Why do you ask, Signor Commendatore? he added. Because the cross was found at the spot and was believed to have been dropped by the assassin, I said. The police had, it seemed, succeeded in discovering the unfortunate woman after all, and had found that she was his wife. You know a man named Leithcourt, I asked a few moments later. Now tell the truth. In this affair, Olinto, our interests are mutual, are they not? He nodded after a moment's hesitation. And you know also that a man named Archer, who is sometimes known as Hornby or Woodruff, as well as a friend of his called Chater? Si, signore, he said. I have met them all, to my regret. And have you ever met a Russian, a certain Baron Oberg, and his niece, Elma Heath? His niece? She isn't his niece. Then who is she? I demanded. How do I know? I have seen her once or twice. But she's dead, isn't she? She knew the secret of those men, and they intended to kill her. I tried to prevent them taking her away on the yacht, and I would have gone to the police, only I dare not. Why? Well, because my own hands were not quite clean, he answered after a pause, his eyes fixed upon mine the while. I knew they intended to silence her, but I was powerless to save her, poor young lady. They took her on board the Leithcourt's yacht, the Iris, and they sailed for the Mediterranean, I believe. Then the name and appearance of the yacht was altered on the voyage, and it became the Lola, I said. No doubt, he smiled. The Iris was a steamer of many names, and had, I believe, been painted nearly all the colors of the rainbow at various times. It was a mysterious vessel, but she exists no more. They scuttled her somewhere up in the Baltic, I've heard. And who is this Oberg? I inquired urging him to reveal to me all he knew concerning him. He stands in great fear of the poor young lady, I believe, for it was at his instigation that Leithcourt and his friends took her on that fatal yachting cruise. And what was your connection with them? Well, I was Leithcourt's servant, was his reply. I was steward on the Iris for a year, until I suppose they thought that I began to see too much and then I was placed in a position ashore. And what did you see? More than I care to tell, signore. If they were arrested, I should be arrested too, you see. But I mean to solve this mystery, Olinto, I said fiercely, for I was in no trifling mood. I'll fathom it if it costs me my life. If the signore solves it himself, then I cannot be charged with revealing the truth was the man's diplomatic reply. But I fear that they are far too wary. Armida has lost her life. Surely that is sufficient incentive for you to bring them all to justice? Of course, but if the law falls upon them, it will also fall upon me. I explained the terrible affliction to which my love had been subjected by those heartless brutes, whereupon he cried enthusiastically, then she is not dead. She can tell us everything. But cannot you tell us? No, not all. The secret she knows has never been revealed. They feared she might be incautious, and for that reason Oberg made the villainous suggestion of the yachting trip. She was to be drowned, accidentally, of course. She is in St. Petersburg now. I left her a week ago. In Russia. Ah, signore, for her sake... 
Don't allow the young lady to remain there. The baron is all-powerful. He does what he wishes in Russia, and the more merciless he is to the people he governs, the greater rewards he receives from the Tsar. I have never been in Russia, but surely it must be a strange country, signore. Well, I said, sitting upon the edge of the bed and looking at him, are you prepared to denounce them if I bring the signorina Heath here to England? But what is the use if we have no clear proof? was his evasive reply. I could see plainly that he feared being himself implicated in some extraordinary plot, the exact nature of which he so steadfastly refused to reveal to me. We talked on for fully half an hour, and from his conversation I gathered that he was well acquainted with Elma. Ah, signore, she was such a pleasant and kind-hearted young lady. I always felt very sorry for her. She was in deadly fear of them. Because they were thieves, I hazarded. Ah, worse. But why did they induce you to entice me to that house in Lambeth? Why did they so evidently desire that I should be killed? By accident, he interrupted, correcting me. Always by accident, and he smiled grimly. Surely you know their secret motive, I remarked. At the time I did not, he declared. I acted on their instructions, being compelled to, for they hold my future in their hands. Therefore, I could not disobey. You knew too much, therefore you were marked down for death, just as you are now. And who is it who is now seeking my life? I inquired gravely. I only returned from Russia yesterday. Your movements are well known, answered the young Italian. You cannot be too careful. Woodruff has been in Russia with you, has he not? I replied in the affirmative, whereupon he said, I thought so, but was not quite sure. And Chater, I inquired, where is he? In London. And the Leith courts? He shrugged his shoulders with a gesture of ignorance, adding, The Signorina Muriel returned to London from Eastbourne this morning. Where can I find her? I inquired eagerly. It is of the utmost importance that I should see her. She is with a relation, a cousin, I think, at Bassett Road, Notting Hill. The house is called Holmwood. You have seen her? No, I heard she had returned. And her father is still hiding from Chater? He is still in hiding, but Chater is his best friend. That is curious, I remarked recollecting the hurried departure from Rannoch. They've made it up, I suppose. They never quarrel, to my knowledge. Then why did Leithcourt leave Scotland so hurriedly on Chater's arrival? You know all about the affair, of course. He nodded, saying with a grim smile, Yes, I know. The party up there must have been a very interesting one. If the police could have made a raid on the place, they would have found among the guests certain persons long wanted. But the arrival of Chater and the flight of Leithcourt had an ulterior object. Chater had never been Leithcourt's enemy. But I can't understand that, I said. Why should Leithcourt have attacked Chater, rendered him unconscious, and shut him up in the cupboard in the library? Was it Leithcourt who did that? he asked dubiously. I think not. It was another of the guests who was Chater's bitterest enemy. But Philip Leithcourt took advantage of the fracas in order to make believe that he had fled because of Chater's arrival. Ah, he added, you haven't any idea of their ruses. They are amazing. So it seems, I said, nevertheless only half convinced that the Italian was telling me the truth. If it was really, as he had said, that the arrival of Chater and the flight was merely a blind, then the mystery was again deepened. Then who was the man who attacked Chater? I asked. Only Chater himself knows. It was one of the guests, that is quite evident. And you say that the flight had been prearranged, I remarked. Yes, with a distinct motive, he said. Then, after a pause, he added with a strange, earnest look in his dark eyes. Pardon me, signor commendatore, if I presume to suggest something, will you not? Certainly. What do you suggest? That you should remain here in this hotel and not venture out. 
for fear of something unfortunate happening to me i laughed i'm really not afraid of minto i added you know i carry this and i drew out my revolver from my hip pocket i know signore he said anxiously but you might not be afforded opportunity for using it when they lay a trap they bait it well i know there are a set of the most ingenious scoundrels in london it's very evident yet i don't fear them in the least i declared i must rescue the signorina heath but signore have a care for yourself cried the italian laying his hand upon my arm you are a marked man ah do not i know he exclaimed breathlessly if you go out you may run right into well the fatal accident never fear olinto i said reassuringly i shall keep my eyes well open here in london one's life is safer than anywhere else in the world perhaps certainly safer than in some places i could name in your own country eh at which he grinned the next moment he grew serious again and said i only warn the signore that if he goes out it is at his own peril then let it be so i laughed feeling self-confident that no one could lead me into any trap i was neither a foreigner nor a country cousin i knew london too well he was silent and shook his head then after telling me that he was still at the same restaurant in westbourne grove he took his departure warning me once more not to go forth half an hour later disregarding his words i strode out into the strand and again walked round to the junior the short wintry day had ended the gas lamps were lit and the darkness of night was gradually creeping on jack had not been to the club and i began now to grow thoroughly uneasy he had parted from me at the corner of the strand with only five minutes walk before him and yet he had apparently disappeared my first impulse was to drive to notting hill to inquire of muriel if she had news of him but somehow the italian's warning words made me wonder if he had met with foul play i suddenly recollected those two men who had passed by as we had talked and how that the features of one had seemed strangely familiar therefore i took a cab to the police station down at whitehall and made inquiry of the inspector on duty in the big bare office with its flaring gas jets and wire globes he heard me to the end then turning back the book of occurrences before him glanced through the ruled entries i should think this is the gentleman sir he said and he read to me the entry as follows p c four six two a reports that at two o seven a m while on duty outside the national gallery he heard a revolver shot followed by a man's cry he ran to the corner of suffolk street where he found a gentleman lying upon the pavement suffering from a serious shot wound in the chest and quite unconscious he obtained the assistance of p c s two eighteen a and three forty three a and the gentleman who was not identified was taken to the charing cross hospital where the house surgeon expressed a doubt whether he could live neither p c s recollect having noticed any suspicious-looking person in the vicinity john percival inspector i waited for no more but rushed round to the hospital in the cab and was five minutes later taken along the ward where i identified poor jack lying in bed white-faced and unconscious the doctor was here a quarter of an hour ago whispered the sister and he fears he is sinking he has uttered no words i asked anxiously made no statement none he has never regained consciousness and i fear sir he never will it is a case of deliberate murder the police told me early this morning i clenched my fists and swore a fierce revenge for that dastardly act and as i stood beside the narrow bed i realized that what olinto had said regarding my own peril was the actual truth i was a marked man was i never to penetrate that inscrutable and ever-increasing mystery end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the czar's spy by william lecoeur this librivox recording is in the public domain 
The Truth About the Lola Throughout the long night I called many times at the hospital, but the reply was always the same. Jack had not regained consciousness, and the doctor regarded his case as hopeless. In the morning I drove in hot haste to Bassett Road, Notting Hill, and at the address Olinto had given me, found Muriel. When she entered the room with folding doors into which I had been shown, I saw that she was pale and apprehensive, for we had not met since her flight, and she was, no doubt, at a loss for an explanation. But I did not press her for one. I merely told her that the Italian Santini had given me her address, and that I came as bearer of unfortunate news. "'What is it?' she gasped quickly. "'It concerns Captain Durnford,' I replied. "'He has been injured in the street and is in Charing Cross Hospital.' "'Ah!' she cried. "'I see. You do not explain the truth. By your face I can tell there is something more. He's dead. Tell me the worst.' "'No, Miss Leithcourt,' I said gravely. "'Not dead, but the doctors fear that he may not recover. "'His wound is dangerous. "'He has been shot by some unknown person.' "'Shot!' she echoed, bursting into tears. "'Then they have followed him after all. "'They have deceived me, and now, as they intend to take him from me, "'I will protect him. "'You, Mr. Gregg, have been in peril of your life, that I know. "'But Jack's enemies are yours, and they shall not go unpunished. "'May I see him?' I fear not, but we will ask at the hospital, and after the exchange of some further explanations, we took a hansom back to Charing Cross. At first the sister refused to allow Muriel to see the patient, but she implored so earnestly that at last she consented, and the distressed girl in the black coat and hat crept on tiptoe to the bedside. He was conscious for a quarter of an hour or so, whispered the nurse who sat there, he asked after some lady named Muriel. The girl at my side burst into low sobbing. Tell him, she said, that Muriel is here, that she has seen him, and is waiting for him to recover. We were not allowed to linger there, and on leaving the hospital I took her back again to Notting Hill, promising to keep her well informed of Jack's condition. He had returned to consciousness, therefore there was now a faint hope for his recovery. Day succeeded day, and although I was not allowed to visit my friend, I was told that he was very slowly progressing. I idled at the Hotel Cecil, longing daily for news of Elma. Only once did a letter come from her, a brief, well-written note from which it appeared that she was quite well and happy, although she longed to be able to go out. The princess was very kind indeed to her, and, she added, was making secret arrangements for her escape across the Russian frontier into Germany. I knew what that meant. Use was to be made of certain Russian officials who were secretly allied with the revolutionists in order to secure her safe conduct beyond the power of that order of exile of the tyrant de Plave. I wrote to her under cover to the princess, but there had been no time yet for a reply. I saw Muriel many times, but never once did she refer to Rannoch or their sudden departure. Her only thought was of the man she loved. "'I always believed that you were engaged to Mr. Woodruff,' I said one day, when I called to tell her of Jack's latest bulletin. "'It is true that he asked me to marry him,' she responded, "'but there were reasons why I did not accept.' "'Reasons connected with his past, eh?' She smiled and then said, Ah, Mr. Gregg, it is all a strange and very tragic story. I must see Jack. When do you think they will allow me to go to him? I explained that the doctor feared to cause the patient any undue excitement, but that in two or three days there was hope of her being allowed to visit him. Several times the police made inquiry of me, but I could tell them nothing. I could not for the life of me recollect where I had before seen the face of that man who had passed in the darkness. One afternoon, ten days after the attempt upon Jack, I was allowed to sit by his bedside and question him. "'Ah, Gordon, old fellow,' he said faintly, "'I've had a narrow escape, by Jove. After I left you I walked quickly on towards the club 
when all of a sudden two scoundrels sprang out of Suffolk Street, and one of them fired a revolver full at me. Then I knew no more. But who were the men? Did you recognize them? No, not at all. That's the worst of it. But Muriel knows who they were, I said. Ah, yes, bring her here, won't you? The poor fellow implored. I'm dying to see her once again. Then I told him how she had looked upon him while unconscious, and how I had taken the daily bulletin to her. For an hour I talked with him, urging him to get well soon, so that we could unite in probing the mystery and bringing to justice those responsible for the dastardly act. "'Muriel knows, and if she loves you she will no doubt assist us,' I said. "'Oh, she does love me, Gordon, I know that,' said the prostrate man, smiling contentedly, and when I left promised to bring her there on the morrow. This I did, but having conducted her to the bed at the end of the ward, I discreetly withdrew. What she said to him I am not, of course, aware. All I know is that an hour later when I returned, I found them the happiest pair possible to conceive, and I clearly saw that Jack's trust in her was not ill-placed. But of Elma? No further word had come from her, and I began to grow uneasy. The days went on. I wrote twice, but no reply was forthcoming. At last I could bear the suspense no longer, and began to contemplate returning to Russia. Jack, when at last discharged from the hospital, came across to the Cecil and lived with me in preference to the junior. He was very weak at first, and I looked after him, while every day Muriel came and ate with us, brightening our lives by her smart and merry chatter. She knew that I loved Elma, and was also aware of the exciting events in Russia, Jack having told her of them during their long drives in hansoms when he went out with her to take the air. One day I received a brief note from the Princess in Petersburg, urging me to remain patient and saying Elma was quite safe and well. There were reasons, however, why she was unable to write, she added. What were they, I wondered? Yet I could only wait until I received word to travel back to Russia and fetch her home. The Princess had promised to arrange everything. December came, and we still remained on at the hotel. Once Olinto had written me, repeating his warning, but I did not heed it. I somehow distrusted the fellow. Jack, now thoroughly recovered, called almost daily at Bassett Road, and would often bring Muriel to the Cecil to tea or to luncheon. Often I inquired the whereabouts of her father and Hilton Chater, but she declared herself in entire ignorance and believed they were abroad. One afternoon, shortly before Christmas, as we were idling in the American bar of the hotel, my friend told me that Muriel had invited us to tea at her cousin's that afternoon, and accordingly we went there in company. The drawing-room into which we were ushered was familiar to me as the apartment wherein I had told Muriel of the attempt upon her lover's life. As we sat together, Muriel, a smart figure in a pale blue gown, poured tea for us and chatted more merrily, I thought, than ever before. She seemed quick and nervous, and yet full of happiness, as she should indeed have been, for Jack Durnford was one of the best fellows in the world, and his restoration to health little short of miraculous. Gordon, he said to me with a sudden seriousness, when tea had ended and we had placed down our cups, I want to tell you something, something I've been longing always to tell you, and now I have got dear Muriel's consent, I want to tell you about her father and his friends. And about Elma, too? I said in quick eagerness. Yes, tell me everything. No, not everything, for I don't know it myself. But what I know I will explain as briefly as I can, and leave you to form your own conclusions. It is, he went on, a strange, most amazing story. When I myself became first cognizant of the mystery, I was on board the flagship, the Renown, under Admiral Sir John Fisher. We were lying in Malta when there arrived the English yacht Iris, owned by Mr. Philip Leithcourt, and among those on board cruising for pleasure were Mr. Martin Woodruff, Mr. Hilton Chater, and the owner's wife and daughter, Muriel. 
Muriel and I first met at a tennis party, and afterwards frequently at various houses in Malta, for anyone who goes there and entertains is soon entertained in return. A mutual attachment sprang up between Muriel and myself, he said, placing his hand tenderly upon hers and smiling, and we often met in secret and took long walks, until quite suddenly Leithcourt said it was necessary to sail for Smyrna to pick up some friends who had been travelling in Palestine. The night they sailed, a great consternation was caused on the island by the news that the safe in the Admiral Superintendent's office had been opened by expert safe-breakers, and certain most important secret documents stolen. Well, I asked, much interested. Again, two months later, when the villa of the Prince of Montevacchi at Palmero was broken into, and the whole of the famous jewels of the princess stolen, it was a very strange fact that the iris was at that moment in port. But it was not until the third occasion, when the yacht was at Villefranche, and our squadron being at Toulon, I got four days leave to go along the Riviera, that my suspicions were aroused, for at that very hour when I was dining at the London house at Nice with Muriel and a schoolfellow of hers, Elma Heath, who was spending the winter there with a lady who was Baron Oberg's cousin, that a great robbery was committed in one of the big hotels up at Simiez, the wife of an American millionaire losing jewels valued at thirty thousand pounds. Then the robberies, coincident with the visit of the yacht, aroused my strong suspicion. I remarked the nature of those documents stolen from Malta, and recognized that they could only be of service to a foreign government. Then came the Leghorn incident of which you told me. The yacht's name had been changed to the Lola, and she had been repainted. I made searching inquiry, and found that on the evening she was purposely run aground in order to strike up a friendship at the consulate, a Russian gunboat was lying in the vicinity. The consul's safe was rifled, and the scheme certainly was to transfer anything obtained from it to the Russian gunboat. But what was in the safe? I asked. Fortunately, nothing. But you see, they knew that our squadron was due in Leghorn, and that some extremely important dispatches were on the way to the Admiral. Secret orders, based upon the decision of the British cabinet, as to the vexed question of Russian ships passing the Dardanelles. They expected that they would be lodged in the safe until the arrival of the squadron, as they always are. They were, however, bitterly disappointed, because the dispatches had not arrived. And then? Well, the only Russian who appeared to have any connection with them was Baron Oberg, the Governor-General of Finland, whose habit it was to spend part of the winter in the Mediterranean. From Elmer Heath's conversation at dinner that evening at Nice, I gathered that she and her uncle had been guests on the Iris on several occasions, although I must say that Muriel was extremely reticent regarding all that concerned the yacht. Of course, she said quickly, now that I have told you the truth, Jack, don't you think it was only natural? Most certainly, dear, he answered, still holding her hand. Yours was not a secret that you could very well tell to me, until you could thoroughly trust me, especially as your father had been implicated in the theft of those documents from Malta. The truth is, he said, turning to me, Philip Leithcourt has been all along the cat's paw of Baron Oberg. A few years ago he was a well-known moneylender in the city, and in that capacity met the Baron, who, being in disgrace, required a loan. He was also in the habit of having certain shady transactions with that daring gang of continental thieves of whom Dick Archer and Hilton Chater were leaders. For this reason he purchased a yacht for their use, so that they might not only use it for the purpose of storing the stolen goods, but for the purpose of sailing from place to place under the guise of wealthy Englishmen travelling for pleasure. Upon that vessel, indeed, were stored thousands and thousands of pounds worth of jewels and objects of value, the proceeds of many great robberies in England, France, and Belgium. Sometimes they travelled for the purpose of disposing of the jewels in various inland towns where the gems, having been recut, were not recognised, while at other times Chater and Archer, 
assisted by Mackintosh, the captain, and Olinto Santini, the steward, sailed for a port, landed, committed a robbery, and then sailed away again, quite unsuspected as rich Englishmen. "'And the crew?' I asked, after a pause. They were, of course, well paid, and were kept in ignorance of what the supposed owner and his friends did ashore. "'But Oberg's connection with it?' I asked, surprised at those revelations. "'Ah!' exclaimed Muriel. "'The ingenuity of that crafty villain is fiendish. Before he got into the Tsar's favour, he owed my father a large sum, and then sought how to evade repayment.' By means of his spies he discovered the real purpose of the cruises of the Iris, for I was often taken on board with a maid in order to allay any suspicion that might arise if only men were cruising. Then he not only compelled my father to cancel the debt, but he impressed the vessel and those who owned and navigated it into the secret service of Russia. A dozen times did we make attempts to obtain secret papers from Italian, French, and English dockyards, but only once in the case of Malta, and once at Toulon, did we succeed. Ah, Mr. Gregg, she added, you do not know all the anxiety I suffered, how at every hour we were in danger of betrayal or capture, and of the hundred narrow escapes we have had of customs out officers rummaging the yacht for contraband. You will no doubt recollect the sensation caused by the theft of the jewels of the Princess Wilhelmina of schaumburg lippe from the ladies' maid in the Rapide between Cannes and Les Arts, the robbery from the Marseille branch of the Crédit Lyonnais, and the great hall of plate from the Chateau of Bardon, the Paris millionaire, close to Arcachon. Yes, I said they were all robberies of which I had read in the newspapers a couple of years before. Well, she said, they were all committed by Archer or Woodruff and his gang, with accomplices ashore, of course, and never once did it seem that any suspicion fell upon us. While the police were frantically searching hither and thither, we used to weigh anchor and calmly steam away with our booty on board. We had with us an old Dutch lapidary, and one of the cabins was fitted as the workshop, where he altered the appearance of the stones, and prepared them ready for sale, while the gold was melted in a crucible and put ashore to be sent to agents in Hamburg. But that night in Leghorn, I said, what happened to poor Elma? I do not know, was Muriel's reply. We were both on board together, and standing at the crack of the door watched you sitting at dinner that evening. Elma told me that she believed that there was a plot against your life, but why, she would not tell me. She evidently knew of the proposed rifling of the safe at the consulate. Oberg himself was also on board, locked in his own cabin. Elma must have overheard some conversation between the baron and one of the others, for she was in great fear the whole time lest they might injure you. Yet it seemed, after all, as though their idea was the same as always, to worm themselves into your confidence. The instant, however, you went ashore, Chater, Woodruff, whom you called Hornby, and Mackintosh, the captain, who, by the way, was an old ticket-of-leave man, went ashore and, of course, broke into the consulate. Then, as soon as they returned, Elma came to my cabin, awoke me, and said that the baron was taking her ashore and that they were to travel overland back to London. She was ready dressed to go, therefore I kissed her, and promising to meet her soon, we parted. That was the last I saw of her. What happened to her afterwards, only she alone can tell us. But she is not the baron's niece, I said. No, there is some mystery, declared Muriel. She holds some secret, which he fears she may divulge, but of what nature I am in ignorance. "'Then you say that your father has never taken any active part in the robberies?' I remarked. "'No. He commenced by lending money and amassed a considerable fortune. Then avarice seized him, as it does so many men, and coming into contact with Archer and his friends, he saw that the idea of the yacht was a safe and profitable one. Therefore he purchased the vessel, and ran it at the disposition of the thieves, 
and subsequently under compulsion in the secret service of Russia, as I have already described to you. The profits were colossal. In one year my father's share was eighty thousand pounds. "'And where is your father now?' I asked. "'Ah!' she exclaimed sadly, her face pale and haggard. "'I have heard that the vessel was scuttled somewhere in the Baltic.' "'That is true. Oberg's purpose having been served, he demanded half the property on board, or he would give notice to the Russian naval authorities that the pirate yacht was afloat. He attempted to blackmail my father, as he had already done so many times, but his scheme was frustrated. My father, because of his inhuman treatment of poor Elma, defied him, when it appears that Oberg, who was in Helsingfors, telegraphed to the admiral of the Russian fleet in the Baltic. The crew from the Iris were at once landed at Riga, and only Mackintosh and my father put to sea again. Ah, my father was desperate, for he knew the merciless character of the man whose victim he had been for so long. They watched a Russian cruiser bearing down upon them, when, just as it drew near, they got off in a boat and blew up the yacht, which sank in three minutes with its ill-obtained wealth on board. And your father? She was silent, and I saw tears standing in her eyes. There was a tragedy, Jack explained in a low, hoarse voice. He and the captain did not, unfortunately, get sufficiently far from the yacht when they blew her up, and they went down with her. And I looked in silence at Muriel, who stood with her head bent and her white face covered with her hands. Almost at the same moment there was a low tap on the door, and the servant-maid announced, "'Mr. Santini, miss!' ah exclaimed jack quickly as olinto entered the room then you had my note we have asked you here to reveal to us this dastardly plot which seemed to have been formed against mr gregg and myself as you know i've had a narrow escape i know signore and the signor commendatore is also threatened by whom by those who killed my poor wife and who intended also to silence me was his answer. The same who compelled you to take me to that house where the fatal chair was prepared, eh? It was Archer who, fearing that you came to London in search of them, devised that devilish contrivance, he said in his broken English. Then, continuing, he went on fiercely, Now that I have discovered why my poor Armida was killed, I will tell the truth and not spare them. Since you left Scotland, Signore, I have been up in Dumfries, and I have discovered several facts which prove that for some reason known only to himself, Leithcourt, while at Rannoch, wrote to both Armida and myself separately, making an appointment to see us at the same time at that spot on the edge of the wood, as he had some secret commission to entrust to us. The letter addressed to me apparently fell into somebody else's hands, probably one of the secret agents of Baron Oberg who were always watching Leithcourt's doing, and he, anxious to learn what was intended, made himself up to look like me, and kept the appointment in my place. Armida, having received the letter unknown to me, went up to Scotland, and was also there at the appointed time. What actually transpired can only be surmised, yet it seems that Leithcourt was in the habit of going up to that spot and loitering there in the evening in order to meet Chater in secret, as the latter was in hiding in a small hotel in Dumfries. Therefore, those who formed the plot must have endeavoured to throw suspicion upon Leithcourt. It is plain, however, as both myself and Armida knew the gang, it was to their interest to get rid of us, because the suspicions of the police had at last become aroused. Poor Armida was therefore deliberately enticed there to her death, while the inquisitive man, whom the assassin took to be myself, was also struck down. By whom? Not by Chater, for he was in London on that night. Then by Woodruff, Durnford said. Without a doubt. It was to his advantage alone to close our lips, because in that same fatal chair in Lambeth, Old Jacob Moses, the Jew bullion broker of Hatton Garden, met his death, 
a most dastardly crime with which none of his friends were associated and of which we alone held knowledge he therefore wrote to us as though from leithcourt calling us up to rannoch in order to strike the blows in the darkness he added in his peculiar italian manner besides he feared we would tell the signore the truth you have not told the police i dare not signore surely the less the police know about these matters the better otherwise the signorina leithcourt must suffer for her father's avarice and evil doing yes cried jack anxiously that's right olinto the police must know nothing the reprisals we must make ourselves but who was it who shot me in suffolk street the same man martin woodruff then the assassin is back from russia he followed closely behind the signor commendatore markov a clever secret agent of baron oberg's came with him then for the first time i recollected that the man i had recognized in the strand was a fellow i had seen lounging in the ante-room of the palace of the governor-general of finland the pair fearing that i should reveal what i knew were undoubtedly in london to take my life in secret now that leithcourt was dead woodruff had united forces with oberg and intended to silence me because they feared that elma besides escaping them had also revealed her secret i trust that the signorina leithcourt has explained the story of the yacht and its crew olinto remarked and has also shown you how i was implicated you will therefore discern the reason why i have hitherto feared to give you any explanation yes i said miss leithcourt has told me a great deal but not everything i cannot yet gather for what reason she and her father fled from rannoch then i will tell you said muriel quickly my father suspected woodruff of being the assassin in rannoch wood for he knew that he had broken away from the original compact and had now allied himself with oberg yet it was also my father's object to appear in fear of them because he was only awaiting an opportunity to lay plans for poor elma's rescue from finland therefore one evening woodruff called and my father encountered him in the avenue and admitted him with his own latch-key by one of the side doors of the castle afterwards taking him up to the study he knew that he had come to try and make terms for oberg therefore he saw that he must fly at once to newcastle where the iris was lying to get on board and sail away with some excuse he left him in the study and then warned my mother and myself to prepare to leave but while we were packing it appeared that chater who had followed was shown into the study by the butler or rather he entered there himself being well acquainted with the house thus the two men now bitter enemies met a fierce quarrel must have ensued and chater was poisoned and concealed woodruff of course believing that he had killed him my father entered the study again and seeing only woodruff there did not know what had occurred some words probably arose and my father again turned and left then we fled to carlisle and on to newcastle and next morning were on board the yacht out in the north sea afterwards landing at rotterdam those she added are briefly the facts as my poor father related them to me and what of poor elma and of her secret when i wonder shall i see her i cried in despair you will see her now signore answered olinto a servant of the prince zurloff brought her to london this afternoon and i have just conveyed her from the station she is in the next room in ignorance however that you are here and without another word i fled forward joyfully and threw open the folding doors which separated me from my silent love silent yes but she could nevertheless tell her story surely the strangest that any woman has ever lived to tell end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen and conclusion of the czar's spy by william lecoeur the sleeper box recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen contains elma's story before me stood my love a slim tragic rather wan figure 
in a heavy dark traveling coat and felt toque her sweet lips parted and a look of bewildered amazement upon her countenance as i burst in so suddenly upon her in silence i grasped her tiny black-gloved hand and then also in silence raised it passionately to my eager lips her soft dark eyes those eyes that spoke although she was mute met mine and in them was a look that i had never seen there before a look which as plainly as any words told me that my wild fevered passion was reciprocated she gazed beyond into the room where the others had assembled and then looked at me inquiringly whereupon i led her forward to where they were and muriel fell upon her and kissed her with tears streaming from her eyes i prepared this surprise for you mr gregg muriel said laughing through her tears of joy olinto learned that she was on her way to london and i sent him to meet her the princess has managed magnificently has she not yes thank god she is free i exclaimed but we must induce her to tell us everything muriel was already helping my love out of her heavy russian coat a costly garment lined with sable and when after greeting jack and olinto she was comfortably seated i took some notepaper from the little writing-table by the window and scribbled in pencil the words i need not write how delighted i am that you are safe that the almighty has heard my prayers for you jack and muriel have told me all about leithcourt and his scoundrelly associates i know too dear for i may call you that may i not how terribly you must have suffered in silence through it all leithcourt is dead he sank the yacht with all the stolen property on board but by the accident was himself engulfed bending and watching intently as i wrote she drew back in horror and surprise at the words then i added we are all four determined that the guilty shall not go unpunished and that the affliction paced upon you shall be adequately avenged you are my own love i am bold enough to call you so some strong but mysterious bond of affinity between us caused me to seek you out and your pictured face seemed to call me to your side although i was unaware of your peril i was sent to you by the unseen power to extricate you from the hands of your enemies therefore tell us everything all that you know without fear for now that we are united no harm can assail us she took the pencil and holding it in her white fingers sat staring first at us and then looking hesitatingly at the white paper before her her position amid a hundred conflicting emotions was one of extreme difficulty it seemed as though even now she was loath to reveal to us the absolute truth muriel standing behind her chair tenderly stroked back the wealth of chestnut hair from her white brow her complexion was perfect even though her face was pale and jaded and her eyes heavy consequent upon her long weary journey from the now frozen north presently when by signs both jack and olinto had urged her to write she bent suddenly and her pencil began to run swiftly over the paper all of us stood exchanging glances in silence neither looking over her but each determined to wait in patience until the end once started however she did not pause sheet after sheet she covered the silence for a long time was complete broken only by the rapid running of the pencil over the rough surface of the paper she had apparently become seized by a sudden determination to explain everything now that she saw we were in real dead earnest i watched her sweet face bent so intently and as the firelight fell across it found it incomparable yes she was afflicted by loss of speech it was true yet she was surely inexpressibly sweet and womanly peerless above all others with the deep-drawn sigh she at last finished and her head still bowed in an attitude of humiliation it seemed she handed me what she had written to me in breathless eagerness i read as follows is it true dear love for i call you so in return that you were impelled towards me by the mysterious hand that directs all things 
You came in search of me, and you risked your life for mine at Kayana. Therefore you have a right to know the truth. You, as my champion, and the princess as my friend, have contrived to effect my freedom. Were it not for you, I should ere this have been on my way to Sagalien, to the tomb to which Oberg had so ingeniously contrived to consign me. Ah, you do not know, you can never know, all that I have suffered ever since I was a girl. Here the statement broke off and recommenced as follows. In order that you should understand the truth, I had better begin at the beginning. My father was an English merchant in Petersburg, and my mother, Vera Bisanov, who, before her marriage with my father, was celebrated at court for her beauty, and was one of the maids of honour to the Tsarina. She was the only daughter of Count Paul Bessanov, ex-governor of Kharkov, and before marrying my father she had, with her mother, been a well-known figure in society. Immediately after her marriage her father died, leaving her in possession of an ample fortune, which, with my father's own wealth, placed them among the richest and most influential in Petersburg. Among my father's most intimate friends was Baron Xavier Auberg, who at that time held a very subordinate position in the Ministry of the Interior. And from my earliest recollections I can remember him coming frequently to our house and being invited to the brilliant entertainments which my mother gave. When I was thirteen, however, my father died of a chill contracted while boar hunting on his estates in Kiev, and within a few months a further disaster happened to us. One night, while I was sitting alone reading aloud to my mother, two strangers were announced, and on being shown in, they arrested my dear mother on a charge of complicity in a revolutionary plot against the Tsar, which had been discovered at Peterhof. I stood defiant and indignant, for my mother was certainly no nihilist. Yet they said that the bomb had been introduced into the palace by the Countess Anna Shiprov, one of the ladies-in-waiting, who was an intimate friend of my mother's, and often used to visit her. They alleged that the conspiracy had been hatched in our house, color being lent to that theory by the fact that a year before a well-known Russian with whom my father had had many business dealings had been proved to be the author of the plot by which the Tsar's train was blown up near Lividia. They tore my mother away from me and placed her in that grey prison van the sight of which in the streets of Petersburg strikes terror into the heart of every Russian, for a person once in that rumbling vehicle is, as you know, lost for ever to the world. I watched her from the window being placed in that fatal conveyance, and then I think I must have fainted, for I recollect nothing more until I found myself upon the floor, with the grey dawn spreading, and all the horrible truth came back to me. My mother was gone from me for ever. In sheer desperation, I went to the Ministry of the Interior and sought an interview with the Baron, who, when I told him of the disaster, appeared greatly concerned and went at once to the police department to make inquiry. Next day, however, he came to me with the news that the charge against my mother had been proved by a statement of the woman Sheeprof herself and that she had already started on her long journey to Siberia. She had been exiled to one of those dreaded Arctic settlements beyond Yakutsk, a place where it is almost eternal winter, and where the conditions of life are such that half the convicts are insane. The Baron, however, declared that, as my father's friend, it was his duty to act as guardian to me, and that as my father had been English, I ought to be put in an English school. Therefore, with his self-assumed title of uncle, he took me to Chichester. For years I remained there, until one day he came suddenly and fetched me away, taking me over to Helsingfors, for the Tsar had now appointed him Governor-General to Finland. There, for the first time, he introduced me to his son Michael, a pimply-faced lieutenant of cavalry, and said in a most decisive manner that I must marry him. I naturally refused to marry a man of whom I knew so little, whereupon, finding me obdurate, he quickly altered his tactics and became kindness itself, saying that as I was young he would allow me a year in which to make up my mind. A week later, while living in the palace at Helsingfors, 
I overheard a conversation between the Governor-General and his son, which revealed to me a staggering truth that I had never suspected. It was Oberg himself who had denounced my mother to the Minister of the Interior and had made those cruel, baseless charges against her. Then I discerned the reason. She being exiled, her fortune, as well as that of my father, came to me. The reason they were scheming for Michael to marry me was in order to obtain control of my money. I saw at once how helpless I was in the hands of that unscrupulous pair, and I recognized, too, sufficient of the baron's methods as the strangler of Finland to show me what kind of character he was beneath that calm, eminently respectable, black-coated exterior. After deliberately sending my poor mother to Siberia, he had assumed the role of my guardian, in order that he might, when I came of age, obtain control of my inheritance, the idea no doubt being that I should marry Michael, and then, after the necessary legal formalities, I should, on a trumped-up charge of conspiracy, share the same fate as my mother had done. "'The infernal scoundrel!' I ejaculated when I read her words, while from Jack, who had been looking over my shoulder, escaped a fierce and forcible vow of vengeance. The baron took me with him to Petersburg when he went on official business, and we remained there nearly a month, the narrative went on. While there I received a secret message from the Red Priest, the unseen and unknown power of nihilism, who has for so many years baffled the police. I went to see him, and he revealed to me how Oberg had contrived to have my mother banished upon a false charge. He warned me against the man who had pretended to be my father's friend, and also told me that he had known my father intimately, and that if I got into any further difficulty, I was to communicate with him, and he would assist me. Oberg took me back to Helsingfors a few months later, and in summer we went to England. He was a marvellously clever diplomatist. His tactics he could change at will. When I was at school, he was rough and brutal in his manner towards me, as he was to all, but now he seemed to be endeavouring to inspire my confidence by treating me with kindly regard and pleasant affability. In London, at Claridge's, we met my old schoolfellow Muriel and her father, a friend of Oberg's, and in response to their invitation went for a cruise on their yacht, the Iris, from Southampton. Our party was a very pleasant one, and included Woodruff and Chater, while our cruise across the Bay of Biscay and along the Portuguese coast proved most delightful. One night, while we were lying outside Lisbon, Woodruff and Chater, together with Olinto, went ashore, and when they returned in the early hours of the morning, they awoke me by crossing the deck above my head. Then I heard someone outside my cabin door, as though with a screwdriver unscrewing a screw from the woodwork. This aroused my interest, and next day I made a minute examination of the paneling, where in one part I found two small brass screws that had evidently been recently removed. Therefore I succeeded in getting hold of a screwdriver from the carpenter's shop, and next night, when everyone was asleep, I crept out and unscrewed the panel, when, to my surprise, I saw that the secret cavity behind was filled with beautiful jewellery, diamond collars, tiaras, necklets, fine pearls, emeralds and turquoises, all thrown in indiscriminately. I replaced the panel and kept careful watch. At Marseille, where we called, more jewellery and a heavy bagful of plate was brought aboard and secreted behind another panel. Then I knew that the men were thieves. But surely, continued the strange story my mute love had written, I need not describe all that occurred upon that eventful voyage, except to tell you of one very curious incident which occurred. I had spoken confidentially with Muriel regarding my suspicions of the men who were our fellow guests, and when in secret I showed her several places on board the yacht where valuables were secreted, she also became convinced that the men were expert thieves to whom her father, for some unexplained reason, rendered assistance and asylum. She told me that since she had left school she had been on quite a number of cruises, 
and at the same party always accompanied my father. She had, however, never suspected the truth until I pointed it out to her. Well, one hot summer's night we were lying off Naples, and as it was a grand festa ashore, and there was to be a gala performance at the theatre, Leithcourt took a box and the whole party were rowed ashore. The crew were also given shore leave for the evening, but as the great heat had upset me, I declined to accompany the theatre party, and remained on board with one sailor named Wilson to constitute the watch. We had anchored about half a mile from land, and earlier in the evening the Baron had gone ashore to send telegrams to Russia, and had not returned. About ten o'clock I went below to try and sleep, but I had a slight attack of fever and was unable. Therefore I redressed and sat with the light still out, gazing across the starlit bay. Presently from my porthole I saw a shore boat approaching, and recognized in it the baron with a well-dressed stranger. They both came on board, and the boatman, having been paid, pulled back to the shore. Then the baron and his friend, a dark, middle-aged, full-bearded man, evidently a person of refinement, went below to the saloon, and after a few moments called to the man Wilson, who was on the watch, and gave him a glass of whisky and water, which he took up to the deck to drink at his leisure. The unusual character of my fellow guests on board that craft was such that my suspicion was constantly on the alert. Therefore curiosity tempted me to creep along and peep in at the crack of the door standing ajar. A closer view revealed the fact that the stranger was a high Russian official to whom I had once been introduced at the government palace at Helsingfors, the privy councillor and senator Paul Polovstov. They were smoking together and were discussing in Russian the means by which he, Polovstov, had arranged to obtain plans of some new British fortifications at Gibraltar. From what he said, it seemed that some Russian woman, married to an Englishman, a captain in the garrison, had been impressed into the secret service against her will, but that she had, in order to save herself, promised to obtain the photographs and plans that were required. I heard the Englishman's name, and I resolved to take some steps to inform him in secret of the intentions of the Russian agent. Presently the two men took fresh cigars, ascended on deck, and cast themselves in the long cane chairs amidships. Still all curiosity to hear further details on the ingenious piece of espionage against my own nation, I took off my shoes and crept up to a spot where I could crouch concealed and overhear their conversation, for the Italian night was calm and still. They talked mainly about affairs in Finland, and with some of Oberg's expressions of opinion, Polovstov ventured to differ. This aroused the Baron's anger, and I knew from the cold sarcasm of his remarks and the peculiarly hard tone of his voice that he was more incensed than he outwardly showed himself to be. He rose and stood with his back to the bulwarks facing his friend, who still sat leaning back in his deck-chair, insisting upon his own views. He was quite calm, and not in the least perturbed by the evil glint in the baron's eye. Perhaps he did not know him so well as I did. He did not know what that look meant. Suddenly, while the privy councillor lay back in his chair, pulling thoughtfully at his cigar, there was a bright, blood-red flash, a dull report, and a man's short, agonized cry. Startled, I leaned around the corner of the deck-house, when, to my abject horror, I saw under the electric rays the Tsar's privy councillor lying sideways in his chair with part of his face blown away. Then the hideous truth in an instant became apparent. The cigar which Oberg had pressed upon him down in the saloon had exploded, and the small missile concealed inside the diabolical contrivance had passed upwards into his brain. For a moment I stood utterly stupefied, yet as I looked I saw the Baron, in a paroxysm of rage, shake his fist in the dead man's face, and cry with a fearful imprecation, "'You hound! You have plotted to replace me in the Tsar's favour!' You intended to become Governor-General of Finland. 
You knew certain facts which you intended to put before his Majesty, knowing that the revelations would result in my disgrace and downfall. But, you infernal cur, you did not know that those who attempt to thwart Xavier Oberg either die by accident or go for life to Kayana or to the mines. And he spurned the body with his foot and laughed to himself as he gloated over his dastardly crime. I watched his rage, unable to utter a single word. I saw him, after he had searched the dead man's pockets, raise the inert body with its awful featureless face and drag it to the bulwarks. Then I rushed forward and faced him. In an instant he sprang at me and I screamed. But no aid came. The man Wilson was sleeping soundly in the bows, for the whisky he had given him had been doctored, went on the narrative. Upon his face was a fierce, murderous look, such as I had never seen before. You! he screamed, his dark eyes starting from their sockets, as he realized that I had been a witness of his cowardly crime. You have spied upon me, girl, he hissed, and you shall die also. I sank upon my knees, imploring him to spare me, but he only laughed at my entreaty. See, he cried, as you saw how he enjoyed his cigar, you may as well see this. And with an effort he raised the dead body in his arms, poised it for a moment on the vessel's side, and then, with a hoarse laugh of triumph, heaved it into the sea. There was a splash, and then we were alone. And you, he cried in a fierce voice, you who have spied upon me, you will follow. The water there will close your chattering mouth. I shrieked, begged, and implored, but his trembling hands were upon my throat. First he dragged me to my feet, then he threw me upon my knees, and at last, with that grim brutality which characterizes him, he directed me to go and get a mop and bucket from the forecastle, and remove the dark red stains from the chair and deck. This he actually forced me to do, gloating over my horror as I removed for him the traces of his cowardly crime. Then, with his hand upon my shoulder, he said, "'Girl, recollect that you keep tonight's work secret. If not, you shall die a death more painful than that dog has died, one in which you shall experience all the tortures of the damned. Recollect not a single word or death.' Now, go to your cabin, and never pry into my affairs again. I went back to my cabin, as I was bid, and sat, speechless, in abject horror. The fiendish actions of the man who was my guardian frightened me. And yet I was utterly helpless. What could I do? Who in holy Russia would hear me? Oberg was a power in the empire. The Tsar himself trusted him. If I spoke, who would believe me? Who would heed the words of a defenceless girl whom he would at once declare to be hysterical? Thus I waited alone in the darkness, watching the lights of the port gleaming across the placid waters, until nearly one o'clock, when the gay party returned, and the baron greeted them merrily as though nothing had happened. But my heart was frozen within me by the recollection of the awful crime that had been committed. "'Why, now I remember,' cried Muriel, amazed. "'I remember that night quite well, how white you were when you came to my cabin and asked to be allowed to sleep in my spare berth. You would tell me nothing, and only said that you were ill. None of us had any idea that such a terrible tragedy had been enacted. But, of course, the Baron had arranged it all, for it was at his instigation, I recollect, that the crew had been given shore leave.' Mackintosh suggested that only half the crew should go, but he declared that if Wilson alone were left, it would be sufficient. "'I, too, recollect the affair quite well,' Jack declared, tugging at his moustache, utterly amazed at my love's strange story. It was a plain statement of hard, astounding facts, and she now stood clinging to me, looking eagerly into my eyes, reading every thought that passed through my mind. A great sensation was caused when the body was discovered. The squadron was lying off Naples about a week after the Iris had left, and while we were there the body was washed up near Sorrento. At first but little notice was taken of it, 
but by the marks on the dead man's linen it was discovered that he was polovstoff one of the highest russian officials who had it was said been warned on several occasions by the nihilists it was therefore concluded that his death had been due to nihilist vengeance elma pointed to the paper and made a sign that i was to read on this i did and the statement ran as follows the real reason why the baron spared my life was because if i died my fortune would pass to a distant cousin living at durham yet his manner towards me was now most polite and pleasant a change that i felt boded no good he intended to obtain my money by marrying me to his son michael whose evil reputation as a gambler was well known in petersburg we travelled back to finland in the autumn and in the winter he took me to stay with his sister in nice yet almost daily he referred to that tragedy at naples and threatened me with death if ever i uttered a single word or even admitted that i had ever seen the man who was his rival and his victim last june commenced another paragraph we were in helsingfors when one day the parent called me suddenly and told me to prepare for a journey we were to cross to stockholm and thence to hull where the iris was awaiting us for mr leithcourt and muriel had invited us for a summer cruise to the greek islands we boarded the yacht much against my will yet i was powerless and dare not allege the facts that i had already established concerning our fellow guests muriel and i it seems were taken merely in order to blind the shore guards and customs officials as to the real nature of the vessel which when safely out of the channel was repainted and renamed the lola and her exterior presented quite a different appearance from the iris the port of leghorn was our first place of call and for some reason we ran purposely upon a sandbank and were towed off by italian torpedo boats next evening you came on board and dined muriel and myself having strict orders not to show ourselves we however watched you and i saw you pick up my photograph which i had that day torn up then immediately after you had left woodruff chater and mackintosh went ashore and were away a couple of hours in the middle of the night just before they returned the baron rapped at the door of my cabin saying that he must go ashore and telling me to dress and accompany him he would never allow me the luxury of a maid fearing i suppose that she might learn too much in obedience i rose and dressed and when i went forth he told me to get my travelling cloak and dressing bag adding that he was compelled to go north as to continue the cruise would occupy too much time he was due back at his official duties he said as soon as i had finished packing the three men returned to the vessel all of them looking dark-faced and disappointed woodruff whispered some words to the baron after which i went to muriel's cabin and wished her good-bye and we went ashore taking the train first to colle salvetti thence to pisa and afterwards to the beautiful old city of siena which i had so longed to see one of my teeth gave me pain and the baron after a couple of days at the hotel de sienne took me to a queer-looking little old italian a dentist who he said enjoyed an excellent reputation i was quick to notice that the two men had met before and as i sat in the chair and gas was given to me i saw them exchange meaning glances in a few moments i became insensible but when i awoke an hour later i was astounded to feel a curious soreness in my ears my tongue too seemed paralyzed and in a few moments the awful truth dawned upon me i had been rendered deaf and dumb the baron pretended to be greatly concerned about me it went on but i quickly realized that i had been the victim of a foul and dastardly plot and that he had conceived it fearing lest i might speak the truth concerning the privy councillor polovtsov for of exposure he lived in constant fear to encompass my end would be against his own interests as he would lose my fortune so he had silenced me lest i should reveal the terrible truth 
concerning both him and his associates. He was not rich, and I have reason to believe that from time to time he gave information as to persons who possessed valuable jewels, and thus shared in the plunder obtained by those on the yacht. From Italy we travelled on to Berlin, thence to Petersburg, and back to dreary Helsingfors, journeying as quickly as we could, yet never allowing me opportunity of being with strangers. Both my ears and tongue were very painful, but I said nothing. He was surely a fiend in a black coat, and my only thought now was how to escape him. From the moment when that so-called dentist had ruined my hearing and deprived me of power of speech, he kept me aloof from everyone. The fear that I should reveal everything had apparently grown to haunt him, and he had conceived that terrible mode of silencing my lips. But the true depth of his villainy was not yet apparent until I was back in Finland. On the night of our arrival, he called in his son, who had travelled with us from Petersburg, and in writing again demanded that I should marry him. I wrote my reply, a firm refusal. He struck the table angrily with his fist, and wrote saying that I should either marry his son or die. The next day, while walking alone out beyond the town of Helsingfors, as I often used to do, I was arrested upon the false charge of an attempt upon the life of Madame Vakurov, and transported without trial to the terrible fortress of Kayana, some of the horrors of which you have yourself experienced. The charge against me was necessary before I could be incarcerated there, but once within, it was the scheme of the Governor-General to obtain my consent to the marriage by threats and by the constant terrors of the place. He even went so far as to obtain a ministerial order for my banishment to Sakhalien, and brought it to me to Kayana, declaring that if in one month I did not consent, he should allow me to be sent to exile. While I was in Kayana, he knew that his secret was safe, therefore by every means in his power he urged me to consent to the odious union. All the rest is known to you, how Providence directed you to me as my deliverer, and how Woodruff followed you in secret, and pretending to be my friend, took me with him to Petersburg. He had learned of my fortune from the Baron, and intended to marry me himself. But now that it is all over, it appears to me like some terrible dream. I never believed that so much iniquity existed in the world, or that men could fight a defenceless woman with such double-dealing and cruel ingenuity. Ah, the tortures I endured in Kayana are beyond human conception. Yet surely Oberg and Woodruff will obtain their well-merited deserts, if not in this world, then in the world to come." Are we not taught by holy writ to forgive our enemies? Therefore, let us forgive. There my silent love's strange story ended. A bald, straightforward narrative that held us all for some moments absolutely speechless. One of the strongest and most startling stories ever revealed. She watched every expression of my countenance, and then, when I had finished reading, and placed my arm tenderly about her slim waist, she raised her beautiful face to mine to receive the passionate kiss I imprinted upon those soft, full lips. "'This, of course, makes everything plain,' exclaimed Jack. Polovtsov was a very liberal-minded and upright official who was greatly in the favour of the Tsar, and a serious rival to Oberg, whose drastic and merciless methods in Finland were not exactly approved by the Emperor. The Baron was well aware of this, and by ingeniously enticing him on board the Iris, he succeeded by handing that small bomb concealed in a cigar, a nihilist contrivance that had probably been seized by his police in Finland, in freeing himself from the rival who was destined to occupy his post. Yes, I said with a sigh. The mystery is cleared up. It is true, yet my poor Elma is still the victim. And I kissed my love passionately again and again upon the lips. End of chapter 18 Conclusion Nearly two years have now gone by. 
There have been changes in holy Russia, many great and amazing changes consequent upon war and its disasters. Russia is no longer the great power that she was once supposed to be. Many events that have startled the world have occurred since that day when I first enfolded my silent love within my arms. One of them is known to you all. You read in the newspapers, without a doubt, how the Baron Xavier Oberg, the persecutor of Finland, the enemy of education, the relentless foe of the defenseless, the man who ordered women to be knouted to death in Kayana, the heartless official whom the Finns called the Strangler, was blown to pieces by a bomb thrown beneath his carriage as he drove to the railway station in Helsingfors on his way to have audience with the Emperor. The secret truth was that the Red Priest decreed that Oberg should die, and the plot was swiftly put into execution, and although five hundred arrests were made, the police are unaware to this day of the identity of the person who directed it, or of who threw the fatal missile. From pillar to post the revolutionists have been hunted by the bloodhounds of police, yet the Red Priest still lives on quietly in Petersburg, and the Princess Zurloff, still unsuspected, devotes the greater part of her enormous income to the cause of freedom. Of Jack and Muriel I need only say that they were married about three months after Elmer's return from Russia, and at the present time they are living on the outskirts of Glasgow, where Jack has secured the shore appointment which he so long coveted. By some means, exactly how is not quite certain, the police discovered that Dick Archer, alias Woodruff, alias Hornby, was concerned in the clever robbery of a dressing-bag containing the dowager Lady Lancashire's jewels from her footman on Euston platform, and after a long search they found him hiding at a hotel in Liverpool. When, however, they went to arrest him, he laughed in the faces of the detectives, placed something swiftly in his mouth, and swallowed it before they could prevent him. Then ten minutes later he fell dead. He knew what terrible revelations must be made if we gave evidence against him, and he therefore preferred death by his own hand to that following a judicial sentence. Chater, although one of the most expert jewel thieves in Europe, had never been actually guilty of any graver offence, and when we heard that he was in San Francisco, where he had opened a small bar and was trying to live honestly, we resolved to allow him to remain there. Indeed, Jack wrote to him about nine months ago, warning him never to set foot on English soil again on pain of arrest. Olinto Santini has recently opened a small restaurant in Western Road, Brighton, and is, I believe, doing very well. And ourselves? Well, what can I really tell you? Mere words fail to tell you of the completeness of our happiness. It is idyllic, that is all I can say. My proposal of marriage was made to Elma a very few days after she wrote down her startling and romantic story, and a year ago, at a little village church in Hertfordshire, we became man and wife, there being present at our wedding Madam Heath, my bride's mother, to whom by my exertions in official quarters in Petersburg the Tsar's clemency was extended, and she was released from that far-off Arctic prison to which she had been sent with such cruel injustice. Two of the greatest London specialists have continually treated my dear wife, and under them she has already recovered her speech, so far indeed that she can now whisper in a low, soft voice. But, they tell me, they are hopeful that ere long her voice will become stronger and speech practically restored. Already, too, she can begin to hear. After all the storms and perils of the past, our lives are now indeed full of a calm, sweet peace. In our own comfortable little house, with its trellised porch covered with roses and honeysuckle that faces the blue channel at St. Margaret's Bay beyond Dover, we lead a life of mutual trust and boundless love. We are supremely content, the happiest pair in the world, we think. Often, as we sit together at evening, 
gazing out upon the great ships passing darkly away into the mysterious afterglow, our hands clasped mutually in a silence more eloquent than words, and as we gaze into each other's eyes, there occurs to us the divine injunction, whom God hath joined, let no man put asunder. End of conclusion. End of the Tsar's Spy by William Lecoeur.